So it's, uh, it's my pleasure uh, on, be on behalf of uh, the steering committee to uh, welcome our two um, workshop facilitators. And so it'll be an opportunity uh, this afternoon to, to extend the learning and deepen the learning from this morning's uh, keynote um, address uh, that both uh, Nancy and Jody gave. So I, I introduced uh, Jody first during the, um, during the keynote uh, address. So I'm going, to, I'm going to switch the order uh, and uh, int introduce to you Gita Ganadad. Nancy Rowe is a Mississauga Ojibwe of the Anishinaabek Nation located on the New Credit First Nation uh, Ontario, in Ontario. Nancy holds an Honours BA in Indigenous Studies and Political Science. She's an educator, consultant, and a traditional pr practitioner of the Anishinaabek lifeways, views, and customary practices, and currently is completing a Master's Degree of Environmental Resource Studies at the University of Waterloo. She's an avid volunteer who coordinates Akinomaya Gaya Gomik, a grassroots initiative to provide educational opportunities for all peoples interested in Indigenous perspectives of life, health, education, history, and the environment. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce Jody, who's Jody Williams, who currently works as the Indigenous Education Lead for the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board, as the co chair for the First Nations Metis and Inuit Education Association of Ontario. Jody is experienced in providing workshops and developing resources to support Indigenous education in schools. She's uh, also the lead uh, of a provincial community of practice for Indigenous knowledge and mathematics, which involves a collaboration with NASA, Maori educators from New Zealand, and the Navajo Nation in the United States. So I, it's my pleasure again to say Ani Bojo and Jimmy Gwetch for um, accepting um, another opportunity to work with us today and deepen our our learning. So with that, again, um, the screen and uh, mics are yours. Welcome. You me start, Jordy? Sure, I was trying to find the mute button. Whenever I screen share, it shuffles things on my computer, then I have to find everything again as to where, where I am, but You're go ahead, yes. <laughs> yes. Bonjour, Gida Kanada and Disnikas, Wakwan Dodam, New Credit Reservation number 40A in Donjava, Michizagi, Gochabuinish Navikwe and Dao. Uh, hi, hello everybody. Uh, my real name is Gidakanadad, but you could call me Nancy. I come from the Bear Clan and I belong to the uh, Michizagig or what some people call us today, the Mississaugas of the Credit or Mississaugas of the New Credit. Um, we're part of the Ojibwe Nation, uh, who are one of three that make up the larger Anishinaabek Nation. Our ancestral lands, uh, traditional territory, or whatever they're calling it today, um, uh, we've held uh, the bottom of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie um, since, in our records, uh, since at least the last Ice Age. Uh, I saw someone mention the Williams Treaty uh, up there. Those would be our, our Michizagig, uh, Mississauga sister nations, uh, such as Curve Lake, uh, Curve Lake, uh, Scugog, Alderville, um, and, and that. So just so you can position uh, who I am, I'm excited to be here and uh, look forward to sharing whatever I can share uh, with you in this workshop. Jody. Okay, Bojo, Miyokich, Dakwe, Dishnika, Semek, Dodam, Anishinaabek, Kwe, Mimwa, Irish Kwe, and Dao. Uh, my name is Jody Williams. Um, thank you for coming into our workshop. Uh, just to position myself in terms of who I am and um, and what I do. So I work as the Indigenous Education Lead for Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. Um, I co-chair along with my colleague Natalka Pokan uh, for the First Nation Métis Inuit Education Association of Ontario, of which Nancy is part of our advisory um, council for that as well. And uh, we do a lot of work together in a variety of uh, educational settings um, within our school board, um, uh, across the province, 
across the country and now internationally. Um, we've, we've literally expanded our relationships across the globe, which is wonderful. Um, and all of this that we do together in partnership is to really advance the goals. We were just talking um, in between our keynote and this time is really to advance the goals of the of the TRC calls to action, which actually haven't haven't been realized yet. Um, and so um, and so this is what we're here to kind of dive more uh, deeper into off of our keynote this morning is to to look at how do we do this together to create change and a little bit about um, my background. So we uh, I've um, I did not uh, our family. Um, has been very much disconnected and not a part of uh, what it means to be an Ishnavik. I come as a, um, my experience as a white person growing up in a white town. Um, and, uh, and so that's the perspective that I bring. Um, and this is why we work, uh, why I work so closely with Nancy, because she brings um, the colonial experience um, what it's like to experience uh, oppression um, every day. Um, and so uh, I would never want to speak on behalf of people who experience that because that's not my lived experience. So for us um, and our family, I have uh, five girls and a granddaughter, um, that those cultural pieces are very much a uh, part of our family in terms of um, picking that up and uh, reclaiming it for a family. But, you know, hopefully you heard a little bit about this morning from our keynotes talk is that is to really differentiate between what's happening in our education system and um, what's happening for Indigenous peoples who are um, picking back up their birthrights and, and experiencing that through their own means. So, so that's the lens that I bring to you, as well as an educator of over 20 years, my background in education. Um, much of that has been in the realm of it, uh, alternative education, but also uh, Indigenous education, Indigenous studies, formerly Native studies. Um, I've worked as a department head. My background is secondary. I worked as a department head. I've worked as a program officer at the uh, Ontario College of Teachers, so I've had some experience there. Um, I've worked on a variety of uh, initiatives with the ministry, so I have a little bit of a uh, sense of what that world is operates like and now at the board office. So, um, so I really come to you with, with my um, experience as an educator is what I'm bringing to this. And I want to encourage you to please ask questions in the chat box. We'll, between Nancy and I, we'll try and um, I either answer those during our presentation or we will uh, try and answer those in the chat box between the two of us. Um, and of course, Ian's here to help facilitate. So, um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about who we are. Um, so we're gonna, you know, let's talk about the education system here. It's, uh, you know, we have to really call a spade a spade and we're all caught up in this trap basically. Um, and, you know, we all come to this space as educators with, you know, we come into this job, um, I believe, with the intention of creating um, positive change, transformative change, inspiring and empowering our youth. Um, but I think it would be, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the system for what it's actually designed to do. And so that's why I think it becomes so frustrating when we find ourselves kind of banging our heads against the wall as to why isn't things changing because these structures um, are very much ingrained to do a certain thing, which is not, you know, it's not designed to create, um, you know, creative thinking, self-sufficient um, human beings. It's very much designed to do the opposite. And on top of that, um, it's been a tool for genocide um, in terms of, we, you know, I think we all now know, hopefully, um, about residential schools and the, um, and the fallout that we're still very much a part of today. And I would even go as far as to say um, there's not much difference between res residential schools and how schools are operating today. Because if you think about it, what is the language we're instructing in? Who's 
ideals, whose um, uh, whose knowledge systems are being privileged, whose histories are being taught, um, who has, you know, what who's what is when we talk about compulsory courses, what do those look like? And so it's still very much entrenched in a very white supremacist um, structure. So over to you, Nancy. Yeah, just uh, on this, uh, just considering that, you know, I'm my, I'm sure everybody knows about residential school um, and what occurred there, uh, probably not intimately, like many of us would, would know intimately uh, what occurred there. Um, and that it, it occurred for, uh, you know, at least a, a couple hundred years, you know, between 170 and, and 200 years. And, you know, we think about, you know, sometimes intent and impacts, but these, these institutions were created specifically uh, to, uh, you know, at, at, at worst uh, to cause genocide since one in two children um, survived them. Uh, and at the very at least uh, to assimilate the Indian into um, the, the Western ways. And, I, I want to be clear about the intent of residential schools uh, and its role, a very significant role in colonialism. They were used uh, to, to uh, as an attempt to achieve the eradication of indigenous, uh, not just our way of thinking, but also uh, our existence. And so, you know, when I think, when I see this slide, and I think about things that's not to criticize uh, the education system as it exists now. Um, it's not to blame. What it is is to say we need to look back at this truth. We also need to look at what's going on in, in the present. So my grandchildren are about to enter this system. And I'll tell you, as a colonized person, I'm very afraid. I'm involved with this system. I work very hard to, to help and support and enlighten and educate uh, in this system. But inside of me uh, is a lot of fear. Uh, how do I protect my grandchildren uh, from the things that they're going to go through, that their mothers went through and that I went through and that you know uh, the generations before us. So even though it looks different, uh, we have to recognize what we are, what we, what we are dealing with. We're dealing with uh, generations of trauma, not to paint Indigenous peoples as, as victims or less than or anything. This is not what this is about. What this is about is recognizing where the harms are being caused and how we can prevent those harms. And, you know, myself, what I, what I go to is I go to our Anishinaabe Kandaswan, how we understand our world, how we deal with problems, how do we deal with conflict resolution. How do we educate people? How do we enlighten people? And I find, you know, people call it indigenous knowledge or whatever. And what I find is that the answers are there and we, we bring those answers forth and, and we apply that. And so we have a big movement in the country right now where people, indigenous people are saying, we gotta be on the land. We gotta really focus on our languages. But what we don't see is that main institution who not only has to start exercising accountability and has a lot of catch up to do when it comes to uh, indigenous education. Not only do we have to see that, we have to also see how does this, how is this going to impact? And so Giwe Oncha Giwen as a concept in, a, in, in what we do. And what it means is taking from the past, bringing it into the present and applying it for the future. Now, when you think about you could take the things that we've always done in the past and bring them in the future and, and apply them or bring them in the present and apply them for the future. That's what I see when I see this picture. You know, that's what I see. We're taking the same things and we're, we're bringing them to the now. We're not questioning. We're not addressing the harm. We're not addressing the history. We're not addressing any of that. And we're using those same processes and applying them now and thinking that we're going to cause a better future, uh, particularly for Indigenous uh, students and, and people. When I think about it in my Anishinaabe world, when I think about it, it's listening to those grandmothers and, and their education and what how they understood our original uh, uh, authentic uh, ways of knowing, doing, and being and bringing that in and bringing that into the present. 
but we have so many dynamics, we have to be so careful. How do we do that? Because as soon as we do something like that, it gets, you know, there's romanticism, there's appropriation, extracted, all kinds of things happen. And it's not to fault, it's not to blame. What it's saying is that, okay, we have to back up and we have to look at ourselves and we have to say, what is it that we are doing? If we're going to do that, we have to build a relationship with indigenous people. So indigenous people can tell us, like myself, if if my if I feel my grandchild is going to be harmed, I'm going to want to prevent that. It's not to blame anybody, it's not to call them out, it's not to say they did something wrong. It's saying I'm standing here because my grandchild's life is important to me. And I'm explaining this to you so that we can stop doing what we're all what we've been doing. And how can we do that together now uh, going forward in the future? That's a it's a big vision for education, and but it's happening, uh, especially on the ground level, grassroots level, teachers and those levels. Uh, we needed to come out of the the, the uh, uh, ministry and things like that. It's happening, but we have to we have to always be thinking about in this you know when we're educating you know what are my beliefs what are my values you know is somebody is somebody is somebody alerting me to the fact that my beliefs might actually and my values and the actions that I'm taking might actually be causing might actually be causing harm and am I open enough do I have enough humility to listen when somebody says I'm causing harm and we'll change the way that we do things uh, going forward so I think to, to sum all that up is to say that let's not fool ourselves in thinking that Indigenous people are entering uh, this institution um, in, in a way that we're, we're trusting of each other. There's a long, deep, uh, brutal history around colonialism and education's role in it. And we have to recognize that we are, we are starting in positions of distrustful positions. So when we reach out to indigenous people, we may not always get, you know, uh, the the reaction that we that we think we're going to get. And so when we think about relationships and changing things in education, and we do Kagera working together, we have to be cognizant of that uh, that we we are not starting in in a healthy relationship. So part of the other piece around this, um, you know, what we're embarking on is that if we're really going to truly change, um, we have to really take a hard look at what does even implicit bias mean. And I always like, you know, when we talk about unconscious bias, well, it's pretty hard to deal with because it's unconscious. You're not aware of the bias that you may have. Um, it's like fish swimming in water. Like you don't, you're in it. And so you, it's hard to see when you're just in it. Um, so it takes a lot of work to chip away, um, and recognize these implications. And, and I'm speaking, you know, coming at this from my own experience in terms of having to, um, really re-examine even these constructs of whiteness, because again, it's a construct. It's a, it's a, um, it's like there's no such thing as race, but the but racism is very very real, and so these constructs and structures that have um, taken place over a very long period of time have been are, are deeply deeply rooted, and so if you as myself as a beneficiary of this simply because of my skin color, um, it's very easy for me to say some things don't exist. So I'll give a little example. Um, I can easily say racial profiling doesn't exist in stores because it's not my lived experience. I don't get profile. I don't get followed. Um, I don't, you know, if I get pulled over for a speeding ticket, my first thought isn't where are my hands how um, is my demeanor going to be a certain way? What is my behavior? Like, I'm not, that's not my go-to instinct because, so I can easily say, well, that doesn't exist because it doesn't exist for me. So what I have to do is I have to listen and then I have to start to see it, which, and this is what happened. This is the good news is that 
it can actually be um, corrected. And, you know, we talk about it, Nancy and I do AQ courses together, and we jokingly say we're building the army, um, because this is why education is so critically important, so that we can start to, um, to recognize the structures that are in place. Um, you know, when we talk about imperialism, cognitive imperialism, our Western education has said this knowledge system is better than this knowledge system. Science and math done in a Western construct is far superior than indigenous knowledge systems. Um, and so that that's very dangerous. And then we we perpetuate this over and over and over again with either a complete erasure of indigenous knowledge systems, or when we do bring them in, I think we really hammered this home in our keynote, is that they tend to be very minimalistic, tokenistic, um, the pan-Indianismistic, that's a new word I just made up. And um, right, and so uh so we have to really think deeply about this and how to move away from this. And I look at it as an educator. I'm either I'm either a racist educator or I'm an anti-racist educator. There is no in between. You're one or the other. And so, and the other thing about racism is really understanding that racism um, is is rooted in structures. It's not about whether I'm nice. I'm a nice person. I can be a really nice person and still be racist because there's a difference in terms of how we are um, uh, addressing these structures that are in place. Did you wanna to add to any of this, Nancy? I guess I like what you just said there, this last point, because when I look at, when I look at this and consider it around racism, you know, and I'm always on about, okay, what's, what's the law? What's, what does the law say? I'm a bear clan, that's what I'm supposed to do. And when I, I think about this and I think about the system that my grandchildren have to walk through, I, it doesn't matter to me if that person is racist. It doesn't matter to me if they, if they, you know, if, if that's, that's how they are. What matters to me is that my grandchildren will be treated uh, in professional um, uh, environments from a pro professional uh, capacity. So I'm not concerned with running around and trying to expose racists. What I'm concerned with is ethics, values, conduct, uh, you know, treatment, equal treatment. Uh, you know, th those are the kind of thing. And it's just a little bit, and I, I like that when we talk like this, because sometimes my, my views are, are a little bit different. And I don't have time to to go and chase, you know, uh, people who are racist around. They exist. That's not my problem. But in these capacities in the education system, you know, there are certain, you know, uh, policies, procedures, and laws that are in place that says you have to conduct yourself in a certain manner. Part of the problem is is that we have absolutely no idea around what indigenous rights are. So you could be applying to me and my family, uh, you could be applying the ideas of equity and inclusion. And in thinking that, you know, those things are going to satisfy uh, my indigenous rights. And we do that in error. And why we do that in error is because we do not understand indigenous rights. And so when I come and I say, you know, that is too that is too close to my spiritual institution. I don't believe it. I, it belongs in this in this building. Uh, that is that is not really equated with me exercising my jurisdiction, uh, control, uh, and protection of my grandchildren over these displays. And so you know, it's it's to see things like that and to bring it back bring it back to there are actual laws and things that govern these things. And maybe we need to be more alert about those indigenous rights and how it is causing harm. And so that's what a lot, like almost, you know, all of my work is around educating people around indigenous rights and what the impacts of colonialism actually look like and how we actually perpetuate colonialism. So you can go to the next slide, Jody how we actually perpetuate colonialism uh, knowingly or unknowingly, you know, don't, don't get upset because, you know, we're mentioning these things. These things occur, we see it every day, 
uh, Jory speaking to you know the experience of of the racism. I see it every day in in every way. I can read an email. I see it in there. You know, I don't have time to unpack what what's the intent or things like that. For indigenous people, and I'll say in my experience, maybe I'm just more alert to it because very well educated and very well immersed in it. But this happens on on daily basis, not just once a day. I, I can't go out the house. I went out the house for appointment yesterday. I probably experienced about maybe six or seven uh, uh, in one conversation with one lady. Uh, I experienced maybe six or seven um, questionable uh, actions, comments, and, and things like that. But did I have time to educate her? Is she worth educating? <laughs> like, will I change something? I, I don't know. But so that you know, Indigenous people, we're experiencing it all the time. We don't always have the space to call it out and the time to educate. And so, you know, we have to think about um, these things. Sorry, I was going to go into the slide, but I, I um, yeah, there we are. Sorry, I'm following along with you. So some of the things uh, that we recognize in that are rampant in the system, and I'm going to say that uh, not for effect, but uh, for truth, is that these are some of the issues that are rampant in, in education. And these are some of the issues that I feel uh, um, are, are most pressing, uh, particularly around human and indigenous rights infringement. And I say that that's pressing because those are the, those are those deep harms. Uh, those are those deep harms that cause your daughters to come home and, and cry because you know the, the teacher didn't hear her when she said, "Stop calling me Pocahontas," or "I'm not a, I'm not an Indian princess." Or those are the deep you know the, those deep harms. And I think by doing things like this, educating around what does that harm look like, what does it feel like. What is it from an indigenous perspective? Academics, we can talk all day and we could, I could, we could, I could do a whole PhD presentation on, you know, the word reconciliation or the word harm. But how does that play out in real life? So that what I'm talking about is head and heart. So we can't, we can't do these things from the head. We have to do it also from the heart. And we have to understand that real life humans are on the end of are, are on the end of these things that we're doing. And we may be, you know, inadvertently perpetuating that colonialism without knowing. But we're we should no no no. I'm gonna stop there because I'm gonna get on a I'm gonna get on a roll and maybe don't have time for that. So I think when um, like as we okay sorry go ahead. So if we're talking about no, go ahead. um yeah, so if we're talking about okay, so so we've now we're now identifying um, these systemic issues that are still very prevalent. Um, so let's and you know we spoke about this this morning about the importance of relationships that require time to build trust and that these relationships can't just be one way. Like it's not just what can I get out of this? Well, I need something. What do I do? or what can I get? It's the reciprocity that's involved so that it's mutually beneficial on both sides. Um, and I'm just looking at the time, of course, we're always running out of time. So I'm gonna go quickly over these next two slides if that's okay. Um, because we, um, just to start to br bring in some examples of why, what Nancy was saying about that consultation and working with the elders, working with the community is so critically important. And so, as I'm, as we've mentioned, um, we have our subject association, and one of the things that really makes us unique um, is that we are guided by this elders advisory council. We mentioned this in our this morning. That these individuals are from all over the province, still have their language. And so this, you know, addition, you know, did so much of this damage. And so it's really their voices. And then I see myself um, as an educator, my job is to live out their hopes and dreams, is to 
um, is to, you know, be on that ground, um, kind of doing what it is that they're asking us to do. And also to to realize like, no, I'm not going to be perfect in this. And also I'm going to have to, you know, swallow some humble pie and, and listen when I, you know, maybe do something, you know, make a mistake. I mean, my, my mistakes today are nowhere near what they used to be. Like I needed a lot of correcting because I, you don't know what you don't know. But the thing is, once you do know, you have a really an important responsibility to make sure that you're, you're doing and acting in those, in the appropriate way, once you have been told. So, you know, coming to learn about some of these truths, um, thinking about, okay, I was doing these things. I mean, I have lots of examples. If we had the time to share in my past classroom ex practice, um, things that I did that were completely not just inappropriate, but illegal. And they were all done. Like it was ministry approved, uh, in the curriculum, all of these things. And I still found myself on the, on the end, on the other end of, uh, I'm causing harm, but, um, you know, I, but this doesn't happen today anymore because I know now that I have to check in and ask, even as the leads are indigenous education leads, we are constantly checking in with each other, with our community. Um, you know, we all have kind of a good network. Everybody kind of knows who's who. And so if we don't know something, we ask and we check in and we see like, what is, you know, is, what do you think about this? It's, it's, it's constantly going like that. And so we're going to move into now some some examples of the power and the incredible, um, you know, unpredictable outcomes that can take place when we do these things working together. Um, and so this is uh, an example in when I was teaching at a school in Brampton um, and we had a, um, uh, we were um, doing this um, project uh, with, uh, Isaac Murdoch, who's sitting there on the ground, um, telling the what's known as the Fisher story. And, you know, when we were thinking about doing this project, which turned out to be like this big mural that was going to be painted by um, Christy Belcourt. And if you don't know who she is, like, you should find out who Christy Belcourt is. But uh, anyway, just like a prolific um, artist. So, so as we were planning this uh, initiative because it was a week long initiative. Um, I reached out to Nancy and I didn't at the time really know Nancy that well. We knew a little bit of each other, but not, not like we know each other today. And, um, because I knew that, you know, being our, our treaty partner, we probably, I probably should have something to do with Nancy. And as a teacher, like, this is the thing. Sometimes you, you just, you just know to do the right thing but you don't necessarily have to know how it's gonna unfold. And I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy to share this story because I know it's an emotional story, but I think it's a very important story, much like the hook we shared this morning because it kind of was a pivotal moment for even our relationship and even moving into how we do everything together now. So well, maybe if you tuned in this morning, you heard me talk a little bit about using um, indigenous way of uh, how we do things when we're involving uh, for relationships and they call this an indigenous paradigm. And, and it has those four elements to it, uh, of respect, uh, reciprocity, uh, relationship uh, and relational accountability. And what had occurred here was uh, Jody reached out to me like anybody from any board would reach out They got my email or whatever. And she asked me if I want to come and, uh, you know, help her, uh, help her do some uh, things with her class and things like that. This feels like a really long time ago. It's been a long time since I told this story. So anyways, uh, what was happening, we're trying to, Jody was trying to create a resource and an art project with Christy and, and Isaac. And I knew of Christy and Isaac, but I didn't really uh, know Christy either at the time. And so, you know, like, you know, like a good niche, I was like calling my sisters and I was saying like, I'm going to go meet Christy Belker. They want me to go do something at this school and, and all this and that. And so I was talking to my, uh, my good chums there, there uh, in that picture. 
uh, Deanna that I was talking to, and I was saying, did you want to go meet uh, Christy Belcourt and this and that? They asked us to come and do an opening and whatnot and be around and things like that. And and they were excited. And, uh, you know, we knew Christy from the uh, walking with our sisters. Uh, it's closed down now, but it went, it ran for years. The reason walking with our sisters initiative uh, is shut down is because what, what that grassroots movement wanted was an inquiry into murdered missing indigenous women, which we got, uh, was it a year or two years now? Uh, two years ago, and so they, they don't do the installations anymore. But what it was, was these moccasin vamps, so the top of the moccasin. If you're an Indigenous woman uh, or somebody that you lost, Indigenous uh, woman murdered or missing or, or otherwise, uh, you could submit, uh, you know, these beaded vamps uh, or these vamps to this uh, installation that was raising awareness across the country. And so and, and the reason we had to raise awareness is because it was an Indigenous issue. Uh, it's been going on for a long time, and our issues don't get addressed. Our issues don't get addressed um, for whatever reasons, colonialism, I'll say. But there was no awareness being raised around uh, where was our murdered and missing Indigenous women? Uh, what is the role of the police, the RCMP, all these kind of things in there? And so, you know, when I was talking to Deanne and there, and I said, uh, you know, we had a we had one over here it was my cousin around the corner. Uh, she was murdered, and uh, you know, I was talking to D, and I said, I said, did anybody ever get the vamps? Did anybody ever get Elaine's vamps uh, into this project? And uh, she said no. And so I called my cousin uh, Elaine's sister, and I said, I said, Lynn, I said, I'm going to see Christy Belcourt the one with the walking with our sisters, I said, um, is it okay if we can get some vamps and, and get them in the installation? Because I didn't want to just, you know, I don't want to overstep the, the family, her sister. And she said, yeah. And so D that night, we were going like the next day or two, D beaded those, those vamps. And this is really important to me because I was able through this opportunity to just because some teacher called, I was able to literally, you know, I, I got to talk to Christy and I said, Christy, I says, uh, you know, I'm a ceremonial person. Do we do, you know, what do you do with this and all this and that? And I got to actually uh, physically give them to her. Now, Lynn, the sister is not in this, in this picture. Um, and why she's not here and they're just too shy and, you know, too shy to, to do that. And so what occurred there uh, in terms of that paradigm was the reach out in respect for this relationship. The reciprocity that occurred resonated all the way through my community. And, and I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to take any kind of ego out of, you know, murdered and missing indigenous women. What I want you to take out of that is the healing that occurred in my community and literally in my family uh, for my cousins and, and my, you know, literally occurred because we, we started a relationship. And so what I wanna say about that is that you do not know uh, the, you do not know the scale of your, of your actions. Jody didn't know. She didn't know that all this was going on. What she knew was she she may, I should call the treaty partner, and that's what she did. She called me, and and she she knew that little bit. So understanding who is my treaty partner uh, is very important when we're engaging in this work. Who is who is the treaty partner? Uh, who is the who are the people that have been literally displaced, dispossessed, and displaced of the territory that you're working and living in, because they're probably fully uh, located on some reserve not far from you. And I'll tell you the importance of that is they still hold jurisdiction in those territories. But beyond that, engaging your treaty partner, we can actually have some real reconciliation in communities uh, for those people. And that, that is what occurred. That's why this is, is so profound is that is what occurred. And it, it, it wasn't mandated by the government. We weren't waiting for some funding proposal. 
we were just being good humans and practicing respect and reaching out to each other to build a relationship, even though it was a little bit scary to build a relationship and say, where can we take this? And so, you know, this, this will always stick with me and, and it will always stick with my, my cousin Lynn. And I, I also know, and of course, you know, Christy's like my sister now and Isaac, he's like the big bad brother, <laughs> you know, and we're, we're good chumps and we're all activists. We're all uh, social justice activists. And uh, we have a good, uh, uh, a good, a good, I don't know how to say that. We have a, we have a good support system. Yeah, and that was because Jody knew enough to reach out to tree partner, yeah. Yeah, and so like this project, this mural project had nothing to do with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Like that's where, and sometimes when you're, you know, when, when you're, building these relationships and doing things with community you have to be open to let the process unfold in the way it's going to unfold you can't control it so you know um although this was a mural project it became like what you can't see in the picture are all these kids behind us witnessing um this profound experience you can see off in the picture, like, so they were learning about murdered and missing women. They were learning about, you know, there's so much more, but it's one thing to learn about something. It's another thing to experience um, and be present uh, in this, um, in these moments, because it's so visceral. Um, so this is kind of, and I'm going to skip the slide, next slide, come back to it, because um, from so one of the things that we learned in doing this, uh, so we went on and had this whole big, uh, you know, mural, beautiful experience. Um, and what ended up happening is it kind of answered this bigger question that has been driving all the work that we're doing is around um, how do I, how do I engage in indigenous knowledge systems um, appropriately, respectfully, and not retell somebody else's story because remember um, when we're telling us if we're telling a story going back to kind of those rules right do you have permission um where did the story come from if you if you're getting like don't don't caution you be very careful with the internet every real story and when i oh, i should also preface when i say story it's not myths legends and lores a story is a knowledge transmission, a vehicle of transmitting knowledge. It contains geographical information, scientific information, all kinds of important um, modes of information that's um, important. Um, and so how do we do this if we don't, we can't necessarily have access to a, a human being? And number one, <laughs> you always try and privilege humans, like actual people, but you know, that not maybe not necessarily like something realistic every single day or all the time. And so what we ended up doing is we built on, it was such a profound experience. We actually, in, and again, in consultation with Christy and Isaac and all the uh, people um, and Nancy, we developed this huge resource. And um, Ian, I'll just ask you to plop that um, website link in the chat box, lessonsfromearthandbeyond.ca. Um, and so we videotaped Isaac and we've recently revisited it's now an animation because this this particular one is geared towards um and then we have an extensive um lessons and um activities and examples and it's all premised around you as the teacher don't have to be the one to tell the story. You play the video, and when the video starts, it also gives uh, it's Isaac talking as himself, so that we're making the connection. You know um, that this is you know real Indigenous people alive today, not something of the past, um, and that this the knowledge and there's all kinds of little um, informative videos like about the topics um, that. Um, Isaac shares as well. And then you as the teacher, you make those connections. You don't have to be the expert of Indigenous knowledge, but what you can do is look for all the natural connections that feed into different curricular areas. Um, and this one has a huge, the, the essence of the story is about our relationship and our roles and responsibilities when it comes to the land. And everyone 
regardless of who you are, where you come from, what your beliefs are, everyone needs water to live. And so, you know, what is our um, ethics and values and responsibilities to ensure that our waters are clean? And that's just one little um, tidbit. So, um, so I just wanted to mention that because this, that was a jumped off of, and since this lessons from the earth is where it started, we've added on, there's another component lessons from the water. And then there's a third one lessons from beyond that's technically live, but it's not um, finished. It doesn't have a teacher. There's going to be a teacher guide and all that um, put to it, but it's technically there. So I'm going to go back to this, the previous slide to speak to, um, you know, this is how we do this. I'll turn it over to Nancy. Yeah, so when we think about um, when we think about that paradigm and we talk about uh, relational accountability, this is where we get into uh, some things about, you know, as somebody asked a question about extractivism, you could also see extractivism as a one off. So when we when TRC came down, uh, and, and things started moving in education, uh, you know, you pretty much just tried to find an Indian to uh, to uh, help you do whatever whatever kind of work you do. And we call this like one-offs, right? And so, you know, I've, I've sent you an email, I've asked you a question, you've responded to the question, I've consulted. Um, and this has a lot to do with, with how we consult, but how we treat indigenous people. And, and we need to be consulting the proper people. So Natalga's question was great. Does that mean we got to call chief and council? Who do we call? Well, this is why you need to build that relationship with the local First Nation or the treaty partner or the inherent rights holder, because they're the one that's going to tell you, this is who we should be talking to. It's not always and only solely chiefs and councils. Now, don't get me wrong. And, you know, I, I understand the politics and I understand the laws of colonialism, but we have this bad habit of projecting our Western ideas of, of how we do things in our Western system onto, the, onto our reservation system. We operate in two different systems. We operate in communities. So if there is something and in honesty, if there is something that is beyond my capacity to deal with in education, I will, I will, as an ambassador for First Nation, I will direct that to the proper department that it needs to go to because our departments are already taxed out. So the education here is very, very different than the education in the provincial system. And so we get our education department uh, overloaded with calls and requests and things like that. And we are not, we do not have the capacity to do it, to deal with those things all the time, even though for our reserve. So each one is individual. So, so don't take this idea of like, that you could blanket the same idea right across. The first point is to engage your local First Nation. If your lead, your board lead, has a good relationship, they'll know exactly who, who to call and who to get in touch with. Uh, and Jody knows, well, we call Nancy for that. You know what I mean? That's what the lead's role is supposed to be in education, is to build those, those community connections and build this sort of, it sounds terrible, but this pool of people that we can use in our, in our board system. And so, on the point of reconciliation, or sorry, too many hours going on today, on the point of relational accountability, Jody, Jody came back. Jody keeps coming back. And Jody knows a lot. Just listening to her present, I'm like, oh my gosh, she has learned so much. Now she becomes, you know, release responsibility. She puts me out of work, so I don't have to work too much here. And I'm so grateful for that. And we have this relationship. So in, in Nishnabe way, when we know each other, we consider each other's family. And we'll conduct ourselves in a different way. I'm not going to hurt or harm her because she has children and grandchildren. And I think this is the way that we have to look at those relationships. It's not relationships to satisfy the TRC. It's relationships that need to develop 
so that we can sit down and have our voice heard and strategize about how we're going to go forward. And so this is an ongoing continuous, and I also like to add in there, a sustainable relationship. We're used to that. We're, we're colonized people. We know what the deal is. We know what the, the plan is. When something comes out of the government, we know how that's going down. That is a one-off, you know? And we don't want that same process transferred over here. And so we do a lot to uh, prevent that. And so, you know, one question that I ask every presentation I do, just to try to help people understand. One question I ask is how is what you're doing professionally, personally, how is what you're doing having a direct positive impact and benefit on the grandchildren uh, of the land that, that uh, you're living in? Because that's what the treaties talk about. They're supposed to be having a good life. So our grandchildren here at, at New Credit, they're supposed to be having a good life. That's what their grandmothers agreed to uh, when they sent the chiefs to go agree to those treaties. So uh, when I think about that, I think about what is that school doing that's having a direct impact and benefit on, on, the, on the, our, our grandchildren here at the reservation? How is that, how is that having a direct impact? And, and that can look so many ways. It can look so many ways. It's not, I got to change the system. If you're a system changer, go for it. But if you're just a teacher who, who recognizes that our, our schools are chronically underfunded and, and you know you buy a few extra books and they're indigenous writers and authors and you donate them to the library at the school, that's how small these movements can be. And, and those are sort of the principles that, that guide these grassroots movements that we're, that we're doing, I think, leading into the Markson project. Okay? Okay. So one of uh, another project again that came about was um, we do uh, um, when I was teaching, we would do these culture camps for students and, you know, we try and get them to do something um, hands on. And we were thinking about how can we do something, you know, that's going to be meaningful and um, a lot of discussion has been had been at the time going on in regards to child welfare. And I know like we're never, the time is always against us here. So um, I don't know, Nancy, what you wanna highlight out of this, but the, cause there's so much. And awesome. Ian, if you can put the link in um, so they can go home.com because really all the information is there. And I know that um, OTF uh, sent you all out a kit as part of um, this project. So Nancy, if you wanna, try to do a real quick overview well there's there's lots on the website um uh and so it's it's more about uh you know there there is a piece pieces of the story that aren't on the website because it would have been inappropriate to uh, put them on there and that's the ceremony pieces and, and stuff like that uh you don't really need me to tell you the story uh, what i need to tell you is almost those principles i was just talking about is that you know you start something uh, and, and my thing is like, what are, what are the current issues? What can we get around? Um, you know, and I, I don't want to do crafts, you know, we're, we're not going to craft our way out of colonialism. Uh, what we need to do is we need to look at the issues. And so we were looking at uh, child welfare uh, was just starting to get exposed at that time. Now we're still dealing with it. Canada is still guilty and Canada is still fighting. Uh, you, you know, for these indigenous babies, this over apprehension, you can you can find out that stuff on the website. But in terms of creating a grassroots movement, this started with a grade 12 class, an awareness session, an information session. Uh, and it started with, you know, Jody reaching out. But what issue do I want to go after? Well, my gosh, we got to do something about babies but never actually having a plan. It's just going, being, you know, reflexive and iterative. It's just going in that way. And so, you know, Isaac and I went and presented to this grade 12 class. We're talking, we got Cora on the phone and, and this thing started to form up. And then, you know, different ones came on and they, they offered help. 
and and this thing you know from there you know i don't know how many years ago two three years ago but using this paradigm and using some of those principles uh, we grew this project especially in around reciprocity uh, we grew this project and we did not intentionally grow it the, the, it became a thing of its own and we thought this would be much better to put uh, across the education system using the education system as a shkabe that's reconciliation in saying that you know jory put her mind on there and saying well we could do we could do this with that for education and i'm putting my mind on there saying well how do we do this for babies and things like that and it really developed it, it became a national uh, project to raise awareness about a contemporary issue that is, you know, the fall of colonialism and maintaining colonialism. And so it's it's a great example. And I guess we won some award or something for race relations and all. We did it with Ontario Human Rights Commission. It turned that organization, uh, their lights on about Indigenous issues and Indigenous rights. And so, you know, don't, don't think that reconciliation has to be something that's huge think down here think down here and say you know i want to help babies i, I want to help indigenous babies that's where the thinking started and i see injustice happening over there now i call my friends and, and we're going to get together and, and try to create something and so it's a great example of a reconciliation project where education and and a grassroots uh, gets together uh, with the intents to merely create awareness. So, uh, yeah, and, I don't know um, what else to say about Yeah, about and just so, just to make sure everybody is uh, aware, because most people, like, most people now have heard about residential schools, but what most people don't know is that today, in 2021, there's a much worse uh, epidemic happening with respect to child welfare. Um, and so this is, project is, raising is shining a light on that like there are more kids in care than ever went to residential school and they're taking babies as they're being born because of policies that are written that says if you're indigenous and you were in the foster care system it's ground it's just automatic grounds for removal and so when we were telling this these stats people were like that can't be like that can't be possible and we're like it is and and it, it's happening as we speak and then people are like no and then we're like yes and why is it that canadians and the public don't know is because these issues never make it to mainstream media or to the general public so because it doesn't it's again it's like that example i gave like i can say that racial profiling doesn't exist because it's not my lived experience well if canadians lived experience is the mainstream media it's very easy for Canadians to think this can't be possible because I've never heard of it. But just because you haven't heard of it doesn't mean it's not it's not happening. And so that's why when we do these informative education projects, um, it's having impacts. And something Nancy didn't mention is that so although this the heavy duty um, genocide is happening in Manitoba, um, we actually this project actually um, there's pictures on I think it's on the website where there was legislative change like this actually had an impact there and again this started not with that intention like the other project this was we never thought okay how are we going to change canadian laws on making moccasins no that's that's not it at all so um anyway so i just wanted to mention that and also we're in the reader's digest like we're in we will be forever in doctor's offices <laughs> with the reader's <laughs> digest moment but um, so yeah, so you all one have thing a. I want to mention yeah, yeah. before we do this. Uh, one thing I want to mention before we leave it is that of course this is beyond us, and the site was created so you could teach it from the website, and and that because we don't have time to you know once in a while I'll go in and I'll do a guest speak or something like that. But we, it was not about, uh, we created it and that's thanks to Jody's help and, and knowing resources and stuff like that. So that this is already packaged up for you to deliver in your 
classrooms. Yeah, I just want to make sure that they know they could spill it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to skip. Sorry, Nancy. I'm going to skip um, around to try and pull out some important pieces because I don't think we can get to all of this information. We'll, we'll go back if we can, but I wanted to move to this piece here and I'm going to put in the chat box where you can access this document. So this um, has it kind of is it's tied back to um, that slide which was speaking about the paradigm right and so we put this out on the our um, on the guidance of our advisory count elders advisory council as well and this is, you know, it was meant to have actually we had the first we used it was with Pearson Publishing Company <laughs> because and ironically, we are yet again having conversations with them over highly offensive, gross material. Um, but really getting people to think differently in terms of the engagement process and who you're consulting and what it is that you're doing. Um, and that also it's very localized as well um, in terms of what's happening, because again, you know, we're speaking to our experiences being Southern Ontario centric, but what's happening up North is very different, you know, or other parts of the province, but, you know, but at the end, but, you know, from the basics, right, is you're going to get, if you're engaging with a fluent language speaker that is very connected to their roots, their community, um, their customary practices, you're gonna get a very different um, experience than connecting with somebody who may be indigenous, but you know has never been to their community, isn't really connected with the community, might be just learning themselves. And so, you know, you have to be careful as to who are you consulting with? And that you're not just consulting with one person. Like Nancy is not going to be advising our board on matters pertaining to Inuit education, for example, right? Like you can't just go to just one person who's the end all and be all of all things Indigenous. Um, there's, you know, there's many nations as well. Um, you know, so we put these guidelines together, you know, as you can see here, things we've touched on, like reciprocity. What are, you know, is there, how are, who's benefiting? Um, and talking about those permissions, again, when you're looking at knowledge systems, um, it's not just a, and it's, we talked about extraction, like, do you have, you know, it's, it's very different to be, to be humble, to be privileged to sit and listen, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have permission to then go and regurgitate or replicate or reproduce. Um, there's, there's very, very, there's big differences in that. And I think a lot of times with our elders, is that so many of them, again, they're not teachers in a classroom. Um, how, what, and I, and I know because I've experienced these both worlds and I mean, Nancy's immersed in these two very, very, very different worlds. Um, it's so different. And so without being able to translate um, when elders are speaking, this is the danger that can happen with respect to appropriation misrepresentation, misunderstanding, and then and then it snowballs into some of these problems that we see. So, you know, we're just, we want people to be um, just very mindful around accessing and utilizing um, people or knowledge systems as well. Anything more on that, Nancy? We only have about five I just minutes wanted to left. mention that, you know, there's, we had lots of projects that we've we've done. And, you know, I recall the guidelines. I recall going back and forth on that, back and forth, you know, the pros. In the last one, I said, it's not about the product, it's about the process. And Jody and I, you know, sitting at the kitchen table and she's saying, what about this? And I'm saying, we still work like that today. We did it on our break. We pulled up a Google Doc and we worked back and forth together. That is, that is a big part of the process. Anything that is being produced goes back and forth, back and forth. And then we take it to the elders and say, what do you think? That takes time. That's something that the Western ideas of how to fulfill a project are completely backward. 
is that we are we do the work down here we do it back and forth back and forth here and co-develop these things and then we go and we might have to change the pros and when jody's talking about you know uh consultation doesn't equal consent well yeah we can teach that we can we can tell the elders this is what we were thinking and they'll you know they'll nod right but that doesn't mean they're giving consent we have to be explicit and we have to say okay now we're going to take the we're going to take these guidelines and we want to spill them to every teacher in the province are you okay with that you see, so it's a constant, like, I don't know what to call, like checking in, reviewing, editing, and, you know, uh, just to, you know, all the things that are, are being produced, that they're in, they're in a dynamic state, meaning that at any time in land acknowledgement should be like this, people, it, meaning that at any time new information, and this is about accountability, new information comes to light then we have a responsibility to correct that immediately. So if an elder five years down the road says, I, I wanna pull back on that statement, it's done. There's no question. That's how you maintain a good, trustful, respectful and accountable relationship. And we do that in, in what we do. So if the elder called tomorrow and said, Jody, I don't want, I, I don't like those guidelines no more. They're, no, they're not effective. It's done. They come off, they, they go down. And that is how you, that is how part of how you maintain those relationships. The other piece is that these are not the end all be all. We, we developed these a couple of years ago. We've learned a lot since that, and, and we'll be revisiting them, you know, like in our spare time, uh, we'll be revisiting them again. And so looking forward, so keep checking in because our documents could be uh evolving or or coming down and that is part of that accountability yeah so i'm just going to share the last couple minutes here just some takeaways because i know everybody likes takeaways <laughs> um so these are things um so in our association we did have to switch to a membership and i will say most um almost all school boards have a membership if you're not sure you can send an email i'll put the contact slide up um, and we've also just uh, agreed to um, provide um, free memberships for teachers and faculty programs. So again, you can send an email about that uh, as well, because I know we're just about out of time. But um, in so there's we do have a page on our site um, that's open, which is called student resources. And I don't know, Ian, if you can quickly like uh, just go fmieao.com pull up the Art. website. It's already in there. It's in the chat. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we do have this open site, um, that is based, that has a whole library of really gorgeous, beautiful videos that although this was actually originally put out, um, in response to the revised, uh, curriculum and this, the teacher guide is specific to grades four and five. However, the videos in here could be used anywhere, K to 12, even for um, uh, adults. And in fact, if you go um, to this under our resources site called In Our Words, and um, I'll put the, there's a, we have a YouTube that's open um, that has this in its entirety, but this, we highly recommend um, teachers going through this. And we would say you could probably use this in grades seven and up. Um, that really um, spells out the history of the land and why people were moved off the land, how treaties started as this initial agreement to, um, you know, live together, mutually benefiting off the lands, et cetera, providing a good life for everyone and how that quickly changed um, to, um, into horrible legislation such as the Indian Act and and so on. Um, and then this is the what we call the truth and reconciliation classroom resource. So um, there's lots of and then there's a whole other section just on resources with all kinds of links and they're all vetted sites. And again, like there really is no excuse for anyone to say I don't know what to teach, because we have like gazillions of ready to go at your fingertips 
no worries of appropriation resources um, to engage with. So I realize we are pretty much at our time here. So I'll just put up our contact information and I, maybe Ian, I don't know if we have time for, for a couple questions or not. I think, are we at the time or? Yeah, sure. Why don't I you take- I was trying to answer this one question. Okay, yes. Take, take a question or two, go ahead. Uh, I started chatting. Yeah. So there's a question in here about uh, elder input into the curriculum. Oh. and that it tends to hang around for years and how would we take that out and so this is actually furthering the argument if you heard earlier in the earlier one you know uh, if you heard uh, earlier if we set it up right in the first place we wouldn't have to worry about those things uh, leading out so I don't know if uh, I'm going to say quote unquote elders were consulted for the curriculum I'm going to say they were not treated very well, especially our FNMIAO elders were treated very poorly, very disrespectfully in the development of the, the curriculum revisions. The ministry's working on it now, trying to repair this relationship. And so everything kind of hangs in limbo. And so what I'm saying is that, yes, we have to identify who the experts are stop running stop running your way of doing things onto our way of doing things because i really believe there's an argument uh, that could be mounted for the ineffectiveness and the inefficiency of continuing to use the same processes that we've always used remember that picture in the beginning if we continue we continue to do that there will be no effect and it is a very inefficient way to deal with things and so these conversations are just starting up. But what we can do is we can start examining who, who should be consulted properly, who is being stood up by the people to be consulted. Uh, these, they have to be inclusive. So, you know, it could be chief and council and a grassroots and an elder. We have an elder expert in education. She was a trustee for, I don't know, what, 15 years or something, Grace Fox. And putting the proper people in the proper places and knowing what their gifts are. So my gifts are not in education. I'm, I've, I've never been a teacher, not, not in your way, not, not OCT certified teacher. My gifts are not in, in that area, but I can teach in our lodges. And so it's recognizing who has what gifts and what strengths that they bring forward. And so I'm glad you asked that question uh, because this, this is, uh, this is where we have to really start thinking about things, the curriculum, the lesson plans, school environments, ministry consultations, I'm working on it, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah, so we can start to change this. You can take the rest, Jordi. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, just kind of adding on, like, yeah, like this is, we talk, so you can't trust the curriculum. Uh, you can't trust resources. Well, you can trust our resources, but, you know, think about textbooks. Often we're using outdated textbooks. Um, there's still, you know, we have problematic language, Iroquois, we won't even go in there, but I'll tell you right now, don't be using that term. If you're wondering why, there's some homework for you, dig in, um, right? Like there's so many, <laughs> there's so much education that's required. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we're the, you know, people are becoming, more aware developed from government um, in whatever way you can uh, to continue, you know, we're supposed to be, this, there's a focus right now on the ministry about on anti-racism education and having a human rights focus. Well, if everyone could start, you know, saying like, yeah, we want, um, you know, we want to ensure that what we're receiving as teachers is is appropriate, right? Because um, this is, but this is where we're in. We're in a messy, we're at a messy time. And this is why going back to when you're working in relationship with community, um, depending wherever you are, when you have these good relationships, it doesn't matter then so much if the curriculum is a problem, because then you can go to your community and your relationships and your people, and you can say, okay, what can we do instead? How do we navigate this better? 
Um, what can we replace this with instead? What would you like to see happening? Um, and again, privileging indigenous voice, privileging the vision of indigenous people at letting the indigenous people be the ones to guide, direct and dictate what's happening. And then us as educators responding to that. And, this, and it's a cycle, check in, do better, learn, check in, do better, learn. And you know, that's how, that's how we're gonna, um, that's how we're gonna, we don't call gay. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yes. so, so on, on that note, uh, Nancy and, and Jody, I, I wanna say again, as, uh, as I did at the end of this morning's uh, keynote, Chi Miigwech, uh, thank you very much for um, sharing your, your knowledge, uh, your skills, your, your, your passion, your advocacy, certainly here. Um, clearly, you know, more, more than three hours isn't, uh, isn't enough uh, with you. Um, it was, it, it, that's a great start. So it just means that we have to continue to work together and keep making that relationship even more uh, solid. You've certainly given us lots of uh, more insights and, and ideas uh, and guidance, as well as some really practical tools that we, that we can take away and, and use in our own practice in, in a good way. So uh, Chimi Gwech for your, for your good words and for all the time that you spent um, behind the scenes, you know, preparing for the keynote this morning, but also for the workshop today. And I know you are making changes, uh, you know, right up, right up to the end and throughout uh, the workshop today. So on behalf of everyone, Chimi Gwech uh, again. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Thank you. Everybody.